Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can order any of those things and find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. And by Safari LTD. All of their dinosaur toys are highly detailed, hand-painted, and thoroughly researched to be scientifically accurate. You can get 15% off all toys at safariltd.com by entering the promo code INODINO. This week, we have an interview with Jesse Adderholt. We have Dinosaur of the Day, Bei Shanlong. We have a bunch of dinosaur news. And we have a holiday gift guide for dinosaur lovers slash enthusiasts. It's that time of year. It is. And we tried to mix it up this year and find a bunch of new stuff. So you're not just going to get the same old stuff that you can find any old place. <laughs> but before we get into that, we want to thank some of our Patreon supporters who are at a level where they get monthly shout outs. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Nutmeg, Taya, Dashiell Hammond, Stego Sophie, Lalin, Ayumi, Paula Canthus, <laughs> Lydia, Kentish, and Jackson Crawford. And as of this recording, the Stegosaurus level has officially filled up. And so now the early bird, early dinosaur <laughs> special pricing <laughs> for the shoutouts has gone extinct and been replaced by the Ankylosaurus level. So you can still get a shoutout. It's just a different level. It's now $8 rather than $5. If you want to check out what other levels we have, then go to our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Also, thank you so much for all of your support and efforts. Yeah, definitely. Especially around this time of year, it makes us feel warm and fuzzy to get the support of everybody. <laughs> if you're looking to give us a Christmas gift, joining our Patreon would be just <laughs> wonderful. But on to the dinosaur news. The first story published in Scientific Reports by Kyung Soo Kim and others, is titled Smallest Known Raptor Tracks Suggest Microraptorine Activity in Lakeshore Setting, which is pretty cool. So smallest known raptor tracks. Actually, they're the smallest known dinosaur footprints of any type ever discovered. Yeah. We're always talking about the largest dinosaurs and, you know, new huge stuff, but it's fun when it goes to the other end of the scale sometimes too. Pretty cute. Yes. So the tracks are less than one centimeter or 0.4 inches long, which is just incredibly tiny if you think about you know, that fraction of an inch. And they were found in the Jinju Formation in South Korea. It's actually right across the river from downtown Jinju City, where Sabrina and I stayed during our Korean dinosaur road trip. It was only like a mile away. We didn't know. Oh, that that's little too tiny bad. Dinosaur tracks. <laughs> yeah. The researchers named them Dromaeosauriformipes. Rarus, which is kind of an awful name, it, but it means <laughs> rare dromaeosaur foot shape. And the pez is at the end of lots of dinosaur track types. Sometimes it's pus. I think that's like the singular version. The word dromaeosaur form of pes is 20 letters long and has eight syllables. So just don't do that if you're going to name <laughs> dinosaur or anything. It's out of control. But the reason it's such a long, crazy name is obviously it started as Dromaeosaur, and then there was a trackway called Dromaeosaur Pus, which is similar, and then they added form to that to be like, oh, it's kind of like Dromaeosaur Pus, so now we're going to make it Dromaeosaur Form of Pus. Ugh. These are slightly smaller than the Dromaeosaur Pus tracks, which were found about 30 kilometers or 20 miles away. So there's really a lot of these small dinosaur tracks in the area. I guess the sediment that they were walking in was just really good for preserving these super light dinosaurs. I mean, these things must have just weighed a few grams. They're so small. It's pretty amazing then. Yeah, that's it's phenomenal preservation. And they also made a video of the recreated track maker walking by a bunch of household objects. So they have it walk by a tennis ball, which it looks like if it curled up, it would have been able to fit inside the tennis ball. Also a box of matches, which is pretty big compared to it, and a cell phone. And I think with the tail fan, you could probably fit a life-size sticker of this dinosaur on the back of your cell phone. That's how small it is. Any phone? Phones seem to be getting bigger. 
Well, yeah, that's why. Actually, in the video, it's a little bit bigger than the phone, mm. but I think their phone is on the smaller side of things. <laughs> Not surprisingly, with the tracks being so small, they think that the tracks might have been made by very young juveniles, basically hatchlings, like fresh out of an egg walking along. No. And unlike most of the times when we find a baby dinosaur, it might not have died at a very young age. Because <laughs> usually we find these fossils of like baby dinosaurs. You're like, oh, it's so cute. And then you're like, oh, but it died and it got fossilized. But it's just a trackway. So who knows? It might have lived a long, healthy life. <laughs> <laughs> and grown a little bit bigger. Yeah. Well, it could have grown quite a bit bigger. They're about the right size for a juvenile microraptor. And it would make sense if they were a microraptor because these tracks were made along a lake shore. And we have some evidence that microraptor ate fish. So it could have been kind of walking along the surf hunting for fish <laughs> or maybe looking for scraps of fish that were left behind or something. But ultimately, I think microraptor got maybe 20 times as big or something. They got much larger than this little guy was. So even if it was a microraptor, which we always think of as a small dinosaur, it would have been, had to have been a hatchling <laughs> to be even that small of a dromaeosaur. They actually found two different sets of tracks of dromaeosaura formipus, and they have very different spacing, the two different sets of tracks. There's one that's closer together, and that probably means that the dinosaur was walking pretty slowly, probably about two kilometers an hour or 1.3 miles an hour, very slow. I mean, I guess for something that small, though, it's still moving its legs pretty quickly. And then the second set of tracks are about twice as far apart, and they estimate that it was going 38 kilometers an hour or 23 miles an hour. Wow. That's very fast. They said that it was likely attacking something, which I thought was kind of fun. I, I'm kind of imagining <laughs> You only like, think it's fun because it's small and cute. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm imagining it too, like running into the surf to like snatch a, you know, little fish or something, oh, okay. not chasing after me. I was thinking like sometimes on the on some beaches you see the plovers, those tiny mm -hmm. birds, and they can run really fast. They can. You can't catch them. And these are 23 miles an hour is almost as fast as an Olympic sprinter doing like a 100 meter dash. So that's a very fast little bird especially for being just a couple inches tall. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. They also say that it's, quote, within the range of estimates for other dinosaurs and is consistent with the maximum running speed estimates for a dinosaur such as an adult velociraptor. Wow. Which definitely would not be as cute and fun to watch <laughs> nope. run quickly. <laughs> You'd try to find a place to hide. Yeah. Yeah, even though they're not as big as the ones in Jurassic Park, you know, something the size of, like, a small dog with sharp claws, and claws yeah. sharp teeth sprinting at you would be terrifying. Get away. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't climb a tree because they might just come up right after you. The authors also had a good statement where they said, such occurrences strongly suggest that small tracks attributed to juveniles or very small tetrapod species are more common than previously supposed, especially where suitable preservation conditions prevailed, end quote. Basically meaning the reason that they named the Ichno species rarus <laughs> is because they expect these to be rare, not rare in that there weren't any baby dinosaurs around, but rare in that it's hard to get the right preservational environment to find these tracks 60 to 100 million years later. And we talk about that kind of thing all the time where it's preservation bias. Not all dinosaurs were huge, but the small ones just don't really fossilize as well. Or we might even just overlook the tracks the picture that they show of these tracks are so tiny. They have the, the standard scale bar next to it. And it's like you could practically cover the whole set of tracks with one little scale bar. So, yeah, it, it would be very easy to miss these if you were just walking around. Because a lot of times you notice dinosaur tracks because it's just somebody hiking and they're like, what's this huge thing with like the three big toes on it? Oh, it's a dinosaur track. But these things are so small and so faint that it would be very easy to just overlook them, especially if you're not a paleontologist and you're just walking around. The other journal article that I want to talk about was published in Historical Biology by Martin Kudrat and others, and it's all about the difference in brain size between tyrannosaurs, and really what they were looking at was the difference between the relatively small and early tyrannosaur D-long compared to the dinosaur that everybody thinks of when you think of Tyrannosaurus T-Rex. 
So this is all based on brain case endocasts. And we've talked about this before, but in order to make any sort of inferences about dinosaur brains, you have to make the assumptions that the brain occupies the full volume of the space, basically inside the head, which is actually kind of a big assumption because you could have a lot of other space around the brain or, you know, like fat or other tissue taking up some space. And they also make the assumption that there's a similar layout to modern brains so that we can make some assumptions about their abilities based on, well, this part of the brain in modern animals is related to hearing, and therefore if it's larger in this animal, we think it had a better sense of hearing kind of thing. So they had to make those standard assumptions. Right. Well, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. But with these assumptions, they describe the D-long endocast as S-shaped, even though I think it looks more like stomach-shaped. <laughs> it's kind of like more oblong and then it's got like a bulge on one end and it's got that little like thing sticking off near the top like the stomach does that kind of attaches to the esophagus it's kind of like an s yeah it is i mean it's not like flat and straight as much as the t-rex so that's i think why they call it like more s-shaped but i think it's stomach shaped and then to me the tyrannosaurus brain looks just like the country morocco on a map <laughs> It's not perfect, but it's really similar to Morocco. So if you want to look at a map and look at Morocco, that's pretty much what a T-Rex brain looks like. Interesting. Yeah. Obviously, it's not S-shaped. You know, it's more flat. And both of them are a lot longer than they are tall. The T-Rex endocast kind of bulges in the middle to a point, just like the country Morocco. And then <laughs> the D-Log bulges at one end, kind of like that droopy part of the stomach. Specifically in D-Long, the back end is lower and more like bulged up than the front part. So it kind of gets thicker as you go back. So the first question is, why are they different at all? And the researchers think that the change in shape might be partly due to the rapid growth of tyrannosaurs. That like they needed a, a more simplified, I guess, brain structure from what I gathered. But this led to some pretty big differences in sort of different parts of the brain. Specifically, DeLong has a, quote, enormous flocculus, which I just love the word flocculus. It's a good word. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. I hope so, because that's definitely the most fun way to say it. <laughs> and the flocculus might have been used to, quote, integrate sensory stimuli about the head rotation during rapid locomotion, end quote. So basically, it has this really huge part of its sort of inner ear, and they think that might mean that it had to interpret a lot of senses as it was running really quickly or turning its head, and it needed like some real good balancing abilities or, you know, real powerful senses in its ear in order to cope with that, which is pretty interesting. And I think they can kind of make that sort of specific assumption because ears don't seem to have changed that much evolutionarily, so I think they can kind of easily attribute part of the ear or the inner ear to different functions, whereas other parts of the brain might be a little more difficult. They also found that the olfactory region, which is the area used for smelling, enlarged a lot as T-Rex evolved compared to D-Long. And that possibly means, obviously, that T-Rex might have relied on its sense of smell more than D-Long did. What it was trying to smell, who knows? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> everything it could possibly eat, which was everything. I guess. It, maybe it was trying to smell other things, too, like how dogs and cats will, like, sort of send messages to each other through scent. Oh, they do talk about that in Raptor Red with the Utah Raptor. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, scent can be useful for all kinds of things. Also, maybe even just, like, seeing if meat is rotten or who knows what. Do you think it cared? I mean, it depends on what kind of gut bacteria it had, I guess, how mm. robust its digestive system was. I suppose it was, no matter what, eating a lot of raw meat, so it would have been able to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would have needed to handle some pretty gnarly conditions. But like I said, since the shape overall changed, it wasn't just areas getting bigger. There were also a couple of areas that got relatively smaller as the animal grew, and specifically they are the prosencephalon, a.k.a. the forebrain, and the mesencephalon, a.k.a. the midbrain. And those include the area called the cerebellum, which most people have heard of. And that's the area in the brain used for decision-making. So it could be the T-Rex 
had a reduced ability to make decisions at sort of a high level, but we really don't know how the cerebellum size impacts behavior. And it's, the authors were a little bit more speculative about this. Whereas with the olfactory and the inner ear, it's like we have a pretty good handle on, you know, that actually making some real world impact on the animal. Not so sure about cerebellum. So it's not just like, eh, T-Rex is dumb, it's cerebellum is smaller, that we can't really make that assumption. But really overall, one thing that you can definitely tell from the study is that T-Rex and D-Long behaved pretty differently given the significant differences in their brains. So it wasn't just as simple as like T-Rex is a bigger version of D-Long. D-Long was probably doing different things in its environment. And I lied when I said that that was the only other journal article that we were going to talk about because our interviewee today, Jesse Adderholt, just published her paper about a new enantiornithine, which we're going to discuss a lot more in our interview. But Brian Eng has a really nice article showing how he developed his artwork for this new dinosaur slash bird. And it's really cool because the new enantiornithine is named Mirarchy, and they have it perched on the horns of Utah Ceratops, because Utah Ceratops is known from the same area, which is just a really cool thing. I love it when these dinosaurs get combined. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. With modern birds, they are often perched on top of other animals. They perch on anything they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Brian actually put a picture of what I think is an egret sitting on top of a water buffalo's head, like right on top of its head. And it pooped on its head, so there's poop running down the face of the water buffalo. <laughs> the water buffalo looks so calm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So in the comments of his article, he was like, so birds probably did basically sit on ceratopsians and maybe pooped on them because, you know. Because why not? They could get away with it. It's what birds do. <laughs> <laughs> they just push their boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think they even think about it. They just go wherever they are. Yeah. But we'll talk more about the actual discovery with Jesse because she's the expert. But before we get to that, as Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's that time of year, holidays. So we came up with a holiday gift guide for dinosaur enthusiasts. There's no particular order here, but we have the list up on our website if you want to check it out. Just to note, some of these are affiliate links. So if you click on them and buy them, then we may get some money. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've also made a Pinterest board if you like to see it in visual form. Ooh. Yeah. Yes, we do have a Pinterest. We don't talk about it too much, but it's there. <laughs> so without further ado, the first potential holiday gift I wanted to talk about is the Jurassic World Super Colossal T-Rex, which is about $50 US. It's three feet long, and it can swallow a mini action figure dinosaur's hole. <laughs> yeah. There's a door on its belly. We've talked about this dinosaur before, or this toy before. Yeah, we talked about it with Jay Jurassic, and he said there's also one that makes noise. And I think he said that the original one, or maybe the one that makes noise, you can find on sale because there's multiple versions of this. So, yeah, some of the inventory is piling up potentially, so you might be able to get one cheaper. Yeah, looks pretty cool. In the picture, there's a kid with the toy, and the toy is almost as big as the kid. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely have to have space for this thing because, like you said, it's three feet long. Yeah. But there aren't very many dinosaur toys that can eat other toys. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Also in the Jurassic World theme, there's the Jurassic World Alpha Training Dinosaur for about 250 US dollars. And we've yeah. definitely talked about this one before. It's blue. You get to train blue. <laughs> <laughs> it's interactive. It's also a good size. It's about a foot tall and two feet long. You do have to charge the toy up before playing. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, it does. And you can see Blue's mood, which changes as you play. You're also supposed to reward and influence Blue's actions. So there's four modes. There's the guard mode, where she's basically your guard dinosaur. She can react to commands. <laughs> but if she's just started training, she's more hostile. Interesting. <laughs> Good to know. In training mode, you can make her like your pet. Reward her with treats and petting. Train her to look around. Then in total control mode, you use the joystick to control her facial reactions. So it's like puppet mode kind of. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and then there's prowl mode where you can send her on the prowl and she works best on flat surfaces. I think she's got wheels or something on her feet. Oh, weird. Yeah. But it is expensive, but it sounds like a lot of fun. And the reviews have been positive. Yeah, that's very expensive. When that one came out, I looked up that old 
dinosaur that's remote controlled that's like white and it sort of looks like a t-rex dragon type thing and it sort of like hobbles back and forth on its two legs you can get those pretty cheap now i think they're like 30 bucks but i don't think anyone sells them new anymore i don't know if they still make them Mm, yeah i haven't seen anything on that it's not really a dinosaur it's like kind of a dinosaur (laughs) (laughs) in the game world you've got red dead redemption 2 which I realize it's not necessarily a dinosaur game, (laughs) but maybe you saw this. We posted it on Facebook and our social media. There's a number of sites in the game where you can dig up dinosaur bones. Apparently there's 30 in the game, so. Yeah, well, I think it's kind of like dragon teeth style. Right, because it's set at the end of the Wild West, 1899 in the U.S. Yeah, that's like right, that's good Bone Wars timing. A little bit on the the tail end of Bone Wars, but still. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but still, yeah, there's a lot of good dinosaurs out in the Wild West, so I really want to play that game. I yeah. just don't have an Xbox. <laughs> and the game, it ranges in price, but it's about 60 US dollars for the standard edition. Standard edition, it's one of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's also Parkasaurus, the game, which is a really cute game. We've talked about this one, too. It's a dinosaur park management game. And you can have your dinosaurs wear cute little hats. It's really colorful. So it's early access on Steam right now. And that's about 20 US dollars. So is it like a park builder? Mm-hmm. But with hats? <laughs> with hats, I know. They're wearing beanies in some of the pictures. <laughs> oh, my God. That's crazy. Yeah. I guess there's also Jurassic World Evolution, which is like a Jurassic Park style park builder. That's pretty fun. We've talked about that one before. Oh, yeah. In Board Game Land, Gary and I stumbled upon this one when we were visiting the Natural History Museum in London. There's, It's called Cluedo, and it's the clue mystery board game, you know, the one where you're solving the murder mystery, but it's with a dinosaur twist. So in the game, someone tried to steal Sophie the Stegosaurus, the one in the museum. <laughs> they failed, but the head and the tail are missing, and it's somewhere in the museum. So you play as one of the six suspects. You have to figure out who stole the fossils, where they hid them, and how they got into the museum, which sounds great. So we have ordered our own. We'll be getting it in the next couple of weeks. It costs 30 pounds, British pounds, plus shipping, which varies depending on which country you're coming from, but I think it might be worth it. I also really like the game Clue. (laughs) (laughs) We also like the book She Found Fossils, which is about $15 U.S., and it was this successful book kickstarted by Maria Eugenia Leon Gold, Abigail Rosemary West, and Amy Gardinier. And it's this picture book about women in paleontology that's available in Spanish and English. And we saw there are a number of copies floating around at SVP. Yeah, they definitely auctioned off at least a couple of them. Mm -hmm. One of them signed by almost everybody who was in the book. That's pretty Uh, cool. Yeah, Yeah. it's almost like a yearbook of famous female paleontologists, which is pretty neat. This one, I have been trying to convince Garrett for a while. He's not sold yet that we need it, but it's a Triceratops (laughs) footstool. (laughs) It costs about $114 US, so yes, pricey. But you can also store things in it. They've got pictures. You can store magazines or blankets or your slippers. It looks really comfortable. It's a plush Triceratops. (laughs) 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 So good for putting your feet on or sitting on. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what we'd do with it, but I want it. <laughs> I see. So going to be your new desk chair? You're going to sit on a little triceratops stool? Well, maybe put my feet there. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, on the less expensive side, we've got a dinosaur succulent planter. There's a ton of these around. Target was selling them for a while. They're all, they come in all different styles. But the one that I like is this it's pretty cute ceramic planter. It's in this origami style at least the one that we'll be linking to. And we have these kind of style dinosaurs, but as lights, which I also like. Yeah, we've gotten three different dinosaur succulent planters as gifts this year, although they're all fake succulents, kind of like glued in. Yeah. Whereas I think this one's for real plants. Yeah, which is what you wanted. Yeah, I'm all about them real plants. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, ours is a, a silver sauropod planter instead, but still good. This one looks really cute. And it, it's nice to keep plants around. In case I haven't said the price yet, that one runs about $14 US. Next, this one's pretty unique. It's Cut Paper Art by Tiffany Miller-Russell. And we saw 
at least one of her works. It was a trilobite in the Picturing the Past exhibit in New Mexico, which we talked to Matt Seleski in our last episode about this exhibit. I think we also saw her Confucia Ornus that are kind of in like a phoenix rising from the ashes kind of style. These are so impressive. They are really cool. And it looks like she does a lot of birds. They're really colorful. They're gorgeous. According to her website, all her paper sculptures are made with found specialty papers. I don't even know what that means. It means she's she found them while, I don't know, walking around or something. <laughs> How do you <laughs> find specialty paper? There's a lot of found artworks. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So most of her pieces are prints. You can buy originals as well. So depending on what you're looking for, the prices could vary greatly. Yeah, I think the cheapest thing is maybe about $5 for a small print, which is, you know, basically like a really high quality picture of the cut paper. Or you can buy like an original large cut paper piece for like $2,000. Yeah. So. (laughs) And I could have stared at her works all day. It is really cool. Yeah. And just thinking about the technique and. What do you even need to do to make something like that? (laughs) I I have no idea. (laughs) It's pretty unique. And then we are also recommending dinosaur mugs because mugs are great. (laughs) (laughs) So we found specifically these ones that are, they cost about 25 US dollars. They're 3D dinosaur porcelain mugs, which we actually found them walking around in Taiwan. (laughs) Yeah, we saw them a bunch of places, yeah. <laughs> they were like all over the place. Not just dinosaurs, though. They have like monkeys oh, and all yeah. sorts of animals. And then they have part of the body of the animal kind of sticking out. The of thing the, you hold as yeah. the handle. So in the dinosaur case, there's a, a sauropod and it's its neck that turns around and that's the handle. <laughs> or some of these are a little awkward to hold, like the one for Tyrannosaur. <laughs> it's just its head sticking out. Yeah, a lot of the theropod ones, it's like they don't really loop back down. It's just like yeah. the, the upper end, like a, almost like a broken handle. Right. Same with the stegosaurus head, but they look so cool. Yeah. So I looked online and apparently you can order them from DH Gate, which I've never ordered from before, but they look the same as the ones we picked up. Nice. Yeah. So, and then the bodies are painted onto the mug. And so from what I saw at DH Gate, they have the stegosaurus, tyrannosaurus, apatosaurus, but there might be others. And then we also have a late addition <laughs> to our list. Actually, Steve sent it to us just before we started recording, which is a Wikipedia dinosaur mug. And on their description, they say, there are over 11,000 known species of dinosaurs, and many can be found on Wikipedia. And of course, that with that many species, they're mostly talking about modern birds. But <laughs> the second eye in the mug, because it, it has Wikipedia written on it, and the eye is dotted by the meteor kind of coming in. And then there's, a, I think, a Triceratops, a T-Rex, and some kind of sauropod on there as well. And it just looks like a really nice mug. And we donate to Wikipedia every year because they have so much good dinosaur information and just good content generally. So it's a really good cause to support. So, yeah. Yeah. And that mug costs about $10 US. Yeah, it's interesting. It's very cheap for like a fundraising effort. Mm Mm-hmm. And we also have our logo slapped on a whole bunch of stuff on (laughs) teespring.com. So if you really want our logo on a mug or a t-shirt or a hoodie or something, you can get it there. And then we have a few honorable mentions for our gift guide. We really believe in these products and like these products, but they've also been sponsors of our show. So I felt like we should put them in a slightly different section. So first up, there's Permia. And we love the t-shirts. Especially Garrett. Yeah, they're great. Half his roared robe. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Very soft, very comfortable. Yep. And then there's also Safari LTD Dinosaur Toys, who are sponsoring this episode for the first time. Just coincidentally, we didn't organize it with this gift guide, but it happened to work out that way. And yeah, we really like their dinosaur toys. So if you're looking for dinosaur toys, that's a a good way to go. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, TRX Dinosaurs, which makes the puppets and the sculptures. And animatronics. Yeah. Since they're made custom to order, they might not make it in time for Christmas if you ordered them now. But they would still be an amazing gift Mm -hmm. regardless. And I definitely recommend them. Send it with a note one. You will get your gift soon. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Maybe you could send a picture of a similar one or something. I'm sure you could work something out. But speaking of TRX dinosaurs, they are a sponsor of this episode as they have been supporting us for quite a while. And we really appreciate it. 
Not only do they make sculptures, they also make puppets as well as animatronics. So you could pick out whatever kind of obscure dinosaur you can imagine or pick some coloration pattern you've never seen before. You could even do Dromaeosauriformipes, something small and cute, fit in your hand. Yes, well, that's technically the name of the track, so that oh, would right. be not a great thing. Okay, okay, <laughs> uh, what you might imagine a baby micro raptor to be. There we go. Yeah. That would be cool. That'd be such an intricate little one, too. Oh, yeah. I believe everything they've made so far has been accurate, like one-to-one scale. There's something really cool about that. Yeah, and then if you have a real life-size dinosaur that could fit in your pocket. You're just going to keep a dinosaur with you all the time? Yeah, why not? Or you could have it on your shoulder like a pirate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or on your head like a Utah ceratops. <laughs> I was thinking like the character in the labyrinth that had like the bird hat. Oh, but, yeah. there we go. <laughs> I was thinking like the water buffalo, except minus the poop. Yeah, yeah, puppets don't poop. Although, I mean, they make animatronics, so if you wanted it to poop, <laughs> they might you might be able to work something out with them. Because <laughs> why not? So if you're interested in getting any dinosaur that you can possibly imagine, then head over to trxdinosaurs.com and fill out their order form. And if you'd like to follow the progress of their current orders and some of the stuff they're working on, then make sure you follow them on Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. And now for our interview with Dr. Jesse Adderholt. So we're joined this week by Dr. Jesse Adderholt, and we first met her at the ALF Museum slash Web Schools, but she's now an assistant professor at the Western University of Health Sciences, and she's also the lead author of the new paper, The Most Complete Enantiornithine from North America and a Phylogenetic Analysis of the Avisoridae. So could you tell us a little bit about your new discovery? Well, I can't quite take credit for, I, I'm not sure I would call it my discovery. I <laughs> definitely did not find the fossil. My co-author, Howard Hutchison, found it. Um, Howard has been a paleontologist with the University of California Museum of Paleontology for quite some time, and he was doing field work in the Kuiperowitz Formation in Utah, so rocks about 75 million years old, mm -hmm. back in the 90s. And he found this fossil in 1992. And for various reasons, it did not get described and published for several decades. And when I was a graduate student, I knew of the existence of this fossil, and I asked Howard's permission to work on it with him. And he said yes. Um, so... My colleague, Jingmei O'Connor, is also one of our co-authors. She is kind of the world expert on enantiornithines. Uh, so Jingmei and I did a detailed analysis of the skeletal anatomy of the bird, and we discovered some cool things about enantiornithines late in their evolution, like they had evolved adaptations for flight similar to what we see in modern birds, but separately from modern birds, kind of mm -hmm. as an example of convergent evolution. Cool. And yeah, I think we talked to Jingmei like three or four episodes ago now. Right. Perfect. At SVP, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she definitely knows her stuff. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. And then you, you made this really nice map in your article that kind of shows where other enantiornithine fossils have been found around North America, but they're all less than 10% complete except for the one that you described. Why do you think they're like so incomplete in the U.S. compared to China where they're like always like these perfect, you know, like full body representations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think um, there's, it's a combination of two factors. Um, one is the preservational environment. In China, uh, those fossils that you see where it's the whole skeleton or most of the skeleton and it's beautifully preserved and squished between two slabs and you get soft tissue preservation, usually the, the preservational environment there was the bottom of a really deep, quiet lake where there wasn't a lot to disturb the dead animal. It got buried pretty quickly. It's buried in very fine sediment, so you get a lot of details and you get the whole thing. Um, a lot of the fossils from North America are found in what we call um, fluvial or deltaic deposits. So these birds died and then we're either ended up either in or near a river, the floodplain of a river, or where the river ends in a delta. So they're getting exposed to high velocity of water, much coarser grained 
sediment or dirt that's beating up the skeleton and separating the skeleton. So for birds, even this relatively large one that we found, their bones are relatively small and delicate compared with huge dinosaurs from the same time period. So that's certainly one factor at play. And I think um, collection bias to a certain degree also. A lot of people doing field work in these sediments from this age are looking for big dinosaurs mm. and uh, paleontologists do a great job. You know, a lot of places will collect sediment to look for microfossils and for, to use for screen washing and finding smaller fossils, but not, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, so if you're out looking for a big triceratops and it's not really on your radar to look for a small bird, that also might be, that would explain the rarity, perhaps not why they're incomplete, but at least the rarity. I think incompleteness is because more of the preservational differences in preservational environment. Gotcha. So what first clued you in that it was in an anti-ornithine since you didn't get like any teeth or part of the skull to go with mm -hmm. it? But this is, again, not something that I can take credit for. It was known, <laughs> it's been known a long time that it was an anti-ornithine. And this is because some of its bones show really classic and anti-ornithine morphologies. So, for example, the tarsum metatarsus, which is the main foot bone, it is, it's composed of several bones that are fused together. So the long bones of the foot that get stuck together and some of the small bones of the ankle also fuse. And in modern birds, all of those bones fuse up so much that you can't even tell almost that they used to be separate bones. Hmm. But in enantiornithines, they remain fused only at their proximal end and unfused for the rest of their lengths, which was actually especially interesting for this bird because it was a later evolving enantiornithine. And there had been hypotheses that perhaps these bones formed of multiple bones or what we call compound elements became increasingly fused through an anti-ornithine evolution. So one interesting story that the new bird tells is that that doesn't seem to have been <laughs> happening. They weren't becoming increasingly fused. So the tarsum metatarsus was one really important bone that clued us in. Um, we have a really gorgeous, complete three-dimensional femur and the femur has this odd little shelf on one end near what attaches to the hip that's mm. called a posterior trochanter. That's something that only in antiornithines have, not modern birds. Um, so there were actually a lot of clues in the postcranial skeleton to let us know it wasn't an antiornithine. Cool. Great. And this was pretty large, right? I think a lot of the articles have been saying it was about the size of a turkey vulture or great horned owl. Yes, that's correct. Somewhere in that range, absolutely. So most of the enantiornithines from the early Cretaceous were smaller in body size, maybe something more like a, a lot of them were quite small, like a songbird, kind of like a house finch or a chickadee, um, and possibly, a, you know, about to the size of a crow on the larger size range. Um, but by the end, late Cretaceous, Nantiornithines had evolved much larger body sizes, and this mm. animal is certainly among the larger ones. That's cool. And it was also a really strong flyer, right? Yes. Yeah. The skeleton tells a really neat story of, to a certain degree, convergent evolution with adaptations that we see in modern birds. Early Cretaceous and Nantiornithines have a relatively low keel on their sternum or breastbone. We know they could fly. They were capable of active flight. But Meraki, the new enantiornithine, appears to have had a deeper keel relative to those early enantiornithines, which indicates bigger flight muscles. It also has a furcula or wishbone that is V-shaped instead of U-shaped. U-shaped is what we see in early enantiornithines. V-shaped is like what we see in modern birds. Mm -hmm. This is also better for more active, advanced flight. And the most exciting feature is that on the ulna, which is one of the forearm bones, we see weird, large rugose or rough patches. And we have interpreted that as evidence of quill knobs, which is where flight feathers actually attach to the bone to help strengthen them against the forces that they experience during flight. And we see this is the first time that quill knobs have been reported in an antiornithine. They're known from modern birds. They're actually known small ones from other dinosaurs that didn't fly. <laughs> but these really big, obvious ones in Mirarchy tell a story 
that it had evolved this feature independently from modern birds and that it was a very strong flyer. That's really cool. So is the you don't get quill knobs on the what would that be the radius at all? No, that is correct. Just on the ulna. Is that are there just like larger feathers on the ulna? Is that what does it? Um, it has to do with the orientation of the two bones relative to each other. So the ulna is the one that is more lateral or out to the side, and that is where the direction the feathers are pointing. Oh, okay. So you, do you get them on like the humerus, or did you find the humerus? We have a complete humerus, and they are not known from the humerus in either modern bo- birds or mirarchy. That's really, <laughs> it's a, I guess there's maybe more force when it's like farther down the wing or something. In birds, the forearm part of the wing is extremely long, as long as the humerus or even longer in some cases. And that is where the most of the primary feathers attach. Mm. So the biggest, most important parts of the wing. That's pretty crazy to me that like these feathers went so deep into the like you know the tissue of the bird that they actually leave marks on the bone like i can't imagine having like hair that that is like that (laughs) deeply embedded it's it's pretty incredible and actually they do attach to the bone of some of their fingers as well Um, so if you ever get the chance to dissect a bird which i highly recommend it's (laughs) fun and fascinating and beautiful um and if you're trying to skin the wing it's so hard because it's you have to use all of your strength to pull the feathers out of the bone. They're that deeply embedded. Wow. And if you're being a good anatomist and you're trying to retain all of the little bones on the wing, you have to be extra careful because it's easy to actually just pull off some of those bones, some okay. of the phalanges um, with the feathers because they're that strongly attached, especially the one that's attached to the thumb bone of birds, which forms a structure called the alula. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. So... Um... You mentioned that the name of the dinosaur is Mirarchy. I was waiting for you to say it to make sure that I was going to say it correctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us how you came up with the name for the dinosaur? We ha- it's named Mirarchy Etani. Etani was the easy part. It is named in honor of Dr. Jeffrey Eaton for his own research, um, important research on fossils from the Kuiperowitz Formation. And he's close friends and colleagues with my co-author, Howard Hutchison. So Howard wanted to honor Jeff. Um, so Etani is in honor of him. And then I got to have fun coming up with a genus name and I actually enlisted the assistance of my close friend and colleague, Dr. Andrew McDonald. I always love the names that Andrew comes up with. We brainstormed together and he gave me some nice suggestions. Um, So Mir is part of Mira, uh, which is Latin for wonderful because the preservational quality is so exquisite. We have three-dimensional preservation. They're not smashed flat like lots of other bird fossils. Um, And we just have all kinds of details of muscle, places for muscle scars and tendinal attachments. Um, And then Arky was actually the name of the flying messenger of the uh, Titans in Greek mythology. So we were naming this after a strong flyer because we know the bird was a strong flyer. Nice. Cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really good name. Thank you. So you also mentioned that it's from the late Cretaceous and that makes it bigger. Are there any other like big differences between it and the early Cretaceous in antiornithines that we usually see? I think we've covered most of them at okay. this point. Uh, the body size was a major trend we confirmed and having more uh, refined adaptations for flight. We don't see that in early in antiornithines, but it was... I thought very interesting and counterintuitive to see some of the similarities that we did, like, for instance, the lack of greater fusion in compound bones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because everybody kind of, even though you try not to, you sort of end up assuming this sort of like nice evolution of animals and that they're all kind of headed in a direction that makes sense. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. That's one of my favorite things about being an evolutionary biologist is how evolutionary stories can be so counterintuitive and (laughs) surprise you and just do weird things or something that doesn't make sense. But it happens because evolution isn't creating things that are perfect. It's just working with the materials that it has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. 
Are there any big differences, I guess I should ask, between it and modern birds, other than that it probably had teeth? Or do you think it had teeth? Because I don't know if we know. I also am not aware of any late Cretaceous and Antiornithines, the skulls, so I don't think we know yet. Gotcha. (laughs) So it was described, or it was found back in 1992, but then it took over 20 years to get described. Is there any, like big reason why it just sat there? There's not. This happens all the time in paleontology. I've had so many journalists ask that question, like maybe it was a secret or it got lost or there's some drama. And really the answer to the question is that paleontologists get excited and there are too many fossils relative to paleontologists. And we all have like 10 different projects we're working on at any given time. And some projects just end up taking a backseat. And this one just somehow didn't end up being a major priority for anyone. Gotcha. Which is totally understandable. (laughs) Yeah. It happens to all of us. Yeah, I hear all the time about how, like, also a lot of paleontologists like going out in the field and it's easier to get grant money and stuff to, like, go out in the field and find new stuff. But then you end up collecting all these things and they just kind of sit on a shelf. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. We need a lot of people to study what's actually in the museums. Not that it's bad to go out and find new ones. That's critical, too, but... There's so much that's already in the museums that's not studied yet. 1992 isn't even that long ago. There's some that are like 70, 80 years, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there are some that sit in collections and are legitimately forgotten about for decades. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So this specimen, I have to ask this because we live pretty close to the University of California Museum of Paleontology. So it's, I assume that it's there. Is it going to be on public display? Do you know? It is in there, in the museum, in the collections. Um, The UCMP, as you guys probably know, is not the type of museum that has a huge collection or a huge exhibit area. The vast majority of their specimens are kept in the back in in the collections. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any plans to put it on display. If there are, I haven't heard about it yet. I do know, however, that the new home of the specimen will be in a special room inside of the collections that's called the type room. And it's for all the type species that the UCMP is in charge of. Uh, So a type species is the original fossil that a new genus or species is named after. So it's going to get a new special permanent home in the type room and perhaps be put on display at some point. I don't know. Yeah, that'd be nice. (laughs) That would be cool. (laughs) Or at least... Maybe at least you can see it on Cal Day. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, I shouldn't write to them and make the suggestion that somebody get it out for that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. So I want to change gears a little bit from this dinosaur because your bio on your website says that you have a personal collection of skeleton skulls and <laughs> plastinated specimens. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so when did you first start collecting these things? I was 11, actually. When, you know, like almost every paleontologist I know, I was a kid who loved dinosaurs. And when I was seven, I decided I wanted to be a paleontologist. And I had a very wonderful childhood. I was so lucky. Um, My parents raised me traveling all over the Western United States to different state parks and national monuments and camping and appreciating nature. And I saw so many amazing fossil sites. Um, and one that we went to is called Anza Borrego Desert State Park. It's mm-hmm. located in southeastern California. And it turned out they had a volunteer, they have, they have it still, a volunteer paleontology program. So I actually joined with my mother when I was nine years old. And I volunteered till I graduated high school when I was 18 years old. And through Anza Borrego, I actually... I was studying fossils, but I learned about the value of studying the anatomy of modern animals. And I still loved paleontology, but I became interested in collecting modern bones and learning how to skeletonize dead things. So the next thing you know, my family is picking up roadkill for me on the side of the road, buying me my own freezer for dead things, helping me start a domestic colony, which is flesh-eating beetles. So it was it was great. That's amazing. <laughs> that is really great. <laughs> so do you, it sounds like you prepare all of these yourself, or at least most of them, if you have a colony of flesh-eating beetles. Uh, I, my colony is dead, sadly. They have been for a few years now. And 
I'm not sure I could, in all fairness, make the claim I've prepared most myself. Many I have prepared myself. Um, but also, again, my friends and family know what I like. So I receive skulls as gifts for my birthday and <laughs> Christmas on a semi-regular basis. Um, but I will say that a few years ago, I decided to expand my skill set beyond just skeletonization. And I took a workshop on plastination, which is the same method of preservation that's used for the bodies and body worlds exhibits. Oh. And since that time, I have been on the side plastinating my own specimens, not humans, of course, <laughs> but plastinating the things that I have in my freezer. So everything that I have in my collection that's plastinated, I did do myself. Cool. And wow. so I don't really know that much about the body exhibit. What is, what is plastinating? Plastinating is a way of essentially replacing the water and the fluid inside of cells of tissue with a liquid plastic, and then you cure it so you can preserve any soft tissue virtually for indefinitely. You wow. basically turn it into plastic, on, kind of, but it still is the real structure and the real tissue at the same time. Um, and it's great. It's not it smells faintly of chemicals, but it's not really smelly anymore. It's plastic, so it lasts forever. <laughs> it's plastic, so it's durable. So I love having plastinated specimens because I can bring them to a class and pass them around. And they're great as hands-on teaching materials because they're so durable and long-lasting. And because you, I, whenever I was younger and dissecting something, it always made me so sad to spend hours or days or weeks doing a beautiful dissection. And then you have to throw it all away in the end or chop it all up and just skeletonize it. And now I can do a dissection and I can preserve it for forever and <laughs> share with other people what I saw. I guess that makes sense why you don't have the flesh eating beetles anymore then. <laughs> well, honestly, that's just because they're surprisingly difficult to maintain. They require uh, a amount of attention, which I just haven't been able to give to them. I would love to have a colony right now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you I'm really fascinated by this plastinating thing now. Did you, you, I assume you like remove the skin and like the hair or feathers or whatever, and then you are just left with like the muscles. Is that kind of the goal? That's what's so cool about it. You can do whatever you want. So my Instagram account, I promise I'm not trying to do self-advertising here, but oh, go ahead. It's totally fine. Of my stuff, <laughs> check out at the lady anatomica. Part of the reason I love it is because I see it as an intersection between art and science, and I love the ability to be creative. So you can skin something completely and plastinate it, or you can leave hair and feathers or fur on. So I have experimented with different variations of this. The first things I plastinated actually were bird feet, where I just lopped off the foot of the bird. I didn't skin it. I didn't do anything. I just chopped it off and I plastinated it whole. So I have some whole plastinated bird feet from a grebe and a pelican and a raptorial bird and a raven. And then I have one where I, I had a snake, a gopher snake. I skinned half of it and I colored the muscles and on the underside, you can see the internal organs and the other half of it is still skinned. Oh, wow. wow. So it's just, it's whatever the plastinator makes of it. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I could see how you got into that since you're so into anatomy. It's so much fun. I love it. When did, is this like a new thing? Plastination has been around for quite a while and it's in use semi-regularly at various medical and veterinary schools. Hmm. The inventor of the method is based in Germany, and he has several massive museums of plastination in Germany. So the method has been around for a while. It's just a little complicated. It requires some semi-specialty equipment and chemicals. And depending on what you want to plastinate, it can require large amounts of acetone, which is flammable. So it's considered somewhat dangerous depending on how much acetone you use. So I think all of those factors are deterrents. Okay. So is that how you get the water out of it using the acetone? Exactly. That's the, well, the second step in the process. The first step is to do a dissection. The second step is you have to leave it in acetone for anywhere from, I would say a month to several months, depending on the size of the specimen oh, so wow. that it's completely dehydrated. And that acetone has replaced all of the water, all of the fluid that's in the cells. Hmm. And then what do you what do you add to make it plastinate? 
the final step of the process is to take your dehydrated tissue or specimen and you place it in a vacuum chamber submerged in a liquid polymer, a liquid plastic. And over the course of several weeks, you gradually lower the pressure inside of the vacuum chamber. And what you're aiming to do ultimately is get the acetone to boil, mm -hmm. not in this case by exposing it to heat, of course, but rather by messing with the pressure. So you lower the pressure so it makes the acetone boil. And when it boils off, it creates a vacuum inside of the cells. And then the liquid plastic gets sucked in to the vacuum. Gotcha. Oh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's really cool. It actually reminds me a little bit. We were just in Oxford and one of our listeners, Professor Chris, showed us this exhibit and in it was a shrunken head. <laughs> <laughs> And he was saying like, well, they don't use heat because if you use heat, then it like destroys the hair. So they just kind of dry it out. It's kind of like a, a very early rudimentary version of plasticizing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a similar thought. <laughs> yeah. So do you have like a cabinet that has all of these specimens in it? Or are they just like all over your house? Or how do you, where do you keep well, all this stuff? For the first time in my adult life, I finally just got space for everything. I managed to get my own office at Western University where I work. And now I have three massive bookshelves that are dedicated to the collection. And I am currently in the process of having fun setting things up, kind of basically setting up my own mini museum in my office. <laughs> It's nice. the best thing ever. <laughs> That's really cool. Okay. I think I'm out of questions about plasticizing. <laughs> but thank you for explaining it. No That's problem. really cool. No problem. So what are you gonna are, are you working on anything now? Anything dinosaur related in particular? <laughs> um, like every paleontologist, I have a million projects I'm working on right now, of course, all vying for my attention. <laughs> um, what's getting my, what my priority is right now, actually, is a research paper on histology of mirarchy. Mm. Um, so when I was in graduate school and studying the specimen, even though the specimen wasn't part of my dissertation, I collected histological samples, so little pieces of bone that get cut up and then you make really thin slices that are thin enough for light to pass through and you can look at them under the microscope and information in the cells of the bone tells you about how quickly the animal was growing at different periods of its life, potentially how old it was when it died. If you get lucky, maybe you find a female that was at a certain stage of the reproductive cycle and you can see that she was in an egg laying stage. So the bone tissue tells you so much. And now that Mirarchy has been published in terms of the anatom anatomical description, I am working on a subsequent study on what the information is that we get from the bone histology. So that's my top priority right now. Nice. Cool. And then you already mentioned your Instagram. Is there anywhere else people can go to follow your work or what you're up to? Um, I have a website, which is literally my name.com, jessieadderholt.com. And I have a research blog there where I post about my recent research and also have links to all of my papers because I think that they should be shared with anyone and everyone who wants them. Nice. Awesome. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was wonderful hearing about your new dinosaur and all the plasticizing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thanks again, Jesse, for taking the time to talk to us. I think Garrett might pick up a new hobby now. I don't know. I don't know if I have the stomach for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I don't. And real quick, I just want to correct. I think I said plasticized about a dozen times when I should have said plastinated because plasticizing is, when, is like a specific thing you do, chemical process for making things more flexible, blah, blah, blah. Plastination is what Jesse does, where it's like that crazy preservation thing that is just amazing. So, yeah, don't get confused like I did. <laughs> and before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to pause for a word from our new sponsor, Safari LTD. We first discovered these dinosaur toys during the planning for our wedding, actually. We 
were deciding what to make for centerpieces, and we thought, like, what if we made little dinosaur dioramas? Mm -hmm. And we looked all over the place at different dinosaur toys and things, and we settled on Safari's collection because they had a huge variety of dinosaurs. We needed, like, 17 of them for all the tables. Yeah, and they looked amazing, and I love the colors. Yeah, and we wanted, we wanted like, kind of interesting dinosaurs, not just dinosaurs that everybody's heard of, and also... To make it just so easy for our guests to find their tables. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, we were planning on not even having numbers and just writing the name of the dinosaur. Like, you know, you're at the Carnotaurus table. And then everyone would be like, what is the Carnotaurus? And then we imagined everyone going around to try to figure out which dinosaur that was. But then we realized that was kind of mean. So we added numbers to go with the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. But whatever the table was named, that was the toy we got for the centerpiece. Yep. And it was really great because their dinosaur toys are all highly detailed, hand-painted, and thoroughly researched, so they're very scientifically accurate, which was another thing we really wanted for our centerpieces. <laughs> I don't know why this was so important to us, but it was. <laughs> and it turned out great. It did, and we actually let the kids at the wedding, like, take the dinosaur toys home with them, so they were running all over, like, kind of fighting over them. Yep. But we kept the ones that were at our table, because we wanted to keep a couple of them. You can probably guess which two were at our table. Yes, but we were we were off for our honeymoon, so we didn't want to take a whole suitcase of dinosaur toys with us. We've since got more. <laughs> and speaking of interesting dinosaur toys, their Instagram has a lot of really great posts of some of the different dinosaurs that they featured, including just a wide variety of ceratopsians that you probably won't find just about anywhere else. They've got a Styracosaurus, Triceratops, Regaloceratops. Wow. A very new and cool looking one. Pachyrhinosaurus, Nasutoceratops, Ineosaurus, Diabloceratops. I love the horns on Diabloceratops. Mm -hmm. And Vagaceratops. So really, they, they cut deep on oh, their yeah. dinosaurs. The frills are very detailed. Yeah. So if you're interested in buying any of these, you can get 15% off all the toys on safariltd.com by entering the promo code I know Dino, and then you can also follow them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Beishan Long, which was a request from Barbarian Luke. So thanks. It was a large Ornithomimosaurian theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now the Gansu province in China. It was robust. It had long arms and legs, and it was very large. It was estimated to be about 26 feet or 8 meters long, though the holotype was still growing when it died, so it probably grew even larger. There were 13 to 14 lines of arrested growth lags, so it was probably a subadult, though its growth had slowed down. And it was estimated to weigh about 1,380 pounds or 626 kilograms. Beishamong may have had teeth and a keratinous beak similar to other dinosaurs, such as Harpymimus. It was possibly omnivorous based on other ornithomimosaurs being omnivores. It was formally described in 2010 by Peter Makovicki and others, and the type species is Beishanlong grandis. The name means North Mountains Dragon. It's a pretty good name. And it refers to Beishan, the North Mountains. <laughs> Makes sense. And the species name means large in Latin. There were three fossils found in the early 2000s, and then it was described and named online in 2009. The howl type was found in 2006. It was a partial skeleton with no skull. And then in 2007, more specimens were found, including hind limbs. In 1999, foot bones were found. They were tentatively referred to Beishan Long. And other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place included Therizinosauroids, Hadrosauroids, and Tyrannosauroids. Nice. And our fun fact of the day is that prior to the discovery of Dromaeosauriformipus, <laughs> just had to say that again, Minosauripus was considered to be the smallest known dinosaur track. You can tell by its name. Yes, it's a little more fitting for its small size. Minosauripus is from a regular old three-toed theropod, <laughs> and they're about one centimeter or 0.4 inches long, so almost as small, except that Dromaeosauriformipus is even smaller than one centimeter. However, Minosauripus weren't always that small. Some tracks have been attributed to Minosauripus that are as large as 20 centimeters, or about 8 inches, which is 20 times as large as the presumably juvenile tracks. It's quite large. Yeah, and it helps to show that, you know, that was probably a juvenile that grew up, and then, you know, you're seeing its foot get bigger. Makes sense. 
And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash I Know Dino for cool rewards. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.